Good afternoon. I'm doing this about 20 minutes to three in the afternoon, kind of on the spur of the moment. And I've been multitasking and rushing around trying to prepare this. So it's going to be a little rough, but I think it's going to be kind of interesting. I had recently mentioned a book ostensibly by Cornelius Matthews, who used to be Matthew Franklin Whittier's publisher in Yankee Doodle in 1847. Um, Matthews, Cornelius Matthews apparently stiffed Matthew for a long series that he was writing, various attempts to see the elephant, I think it was called. So his ethics are a little bit called into question anyway. When I got into this book, it was published in 1850 originally, it's called Chanticleer, A Thanksgiving Story of the Peabody Family. First of all, I knew that Matthew was really big into the name Peabody and into calling roosters Chanticleer. So that immediately keyed me in that that was probably Matthew's work. When I got into it, I realized it really was primarily Abby, Abby Poy and Whittier's work. Actually, I don't think they were married yet at that time. I think this was 1834, maybe 1835. Matthew was busy writing five novels during those two years, which were mistakenly attributed to Asa Green, his former editor on the New York Constellation. I think he was in town and Haverhill quite a bit during that time, and I think that he collaborated with Abby on this Thanksgiving story. I shared some of that with you recently, and I also wrote quite a bit about it in the last couple of written blogs. So if you want to know more about that, I would go to the written blogs for that. And I was going to make a written blog of this, and I said, no, I think this is better as a video. So what happened was, is I was online, and I was just trying to see if I could find on uh, Google, in this case, a juxtaposition between the title of this little book about Thanksgiving and the name Whittier. And I came up with uh, a page that had to do with seeds, you know, um, gardening. And she had put two poems. I don't think they were back to back, but they were on the same page. And uh, one of them, I think, was an excerpt from this book. And another one was a poem that's ostensibly by John Greenleaf Whittier. And it is, I got to get my glasses now. Where the heck did I put my glasses? Let's see. I put them in my pocket. So I never find them. Um, the only... The only better place to hide your glasses is on your head, at least around here, but in the pocket will do. So it's called Song of the Pumpkin, <clears throat> written on receiving the gift of a pumpkin pie, but that's not what it's called in the book. In the book where it's published in 1850, it's called, um, it's in a book called Poems by John Greenleaf Whittier, and it's just called, I think it's called Pumpkin Pie, and of all things, I didn't write that down. Let's see. The Pumpkin, excuse me. It's called The Pumpkin in that book. So, um, but first it appeared in the October 1, 1846 edition of the Boston Chronotype. Now, there's a backstory to this that I have extrapolated, and I'm going to give it briefly, but I'm not going to tell you all the steps that I used to get to this backstory because they're multifarious, okay? They're legion. But what I think must have happened, first of all, the Chronotype, edited by Elijah Wright, was a radical newspaper. He was an abolitionist. He was, I think, a member of the anti American Anti-Slavery Society. He was apparently close friends with both of the Whittier brothers there in Boston. So he would have, in 1846, apparently, he invited both of these bachelors. Well, I guess Matthew is not a bachelor at this time, but his his second family with his arranged marriage, he's pretty much estranged from her, and they're in Portland, so he's in Boston at the time. And anyway, the, both of the Whittier brothers got an invitation to Thanksgiving dinner. Now, Matthew's childhood nickname apparently was Peter Pumpkin, and he loved pumpkin pie and pumpkins in general, but he loved pumpkin pie, and he would refer to himself, and I think people used to refer to him when he was little, as some pumpkins. Boy, that kid is some pumpkins. So he's all about pumpkins, see? So what happened was, I think, is that Matthew raved about Mrs. Wright's pumpkin pie, and she decided to give him one as a going away present, see? Well, of course, what he did was to turn around and write a poem, you know, in praise of the pumpkin pie and in thanks to her. So that's why it's called 
Song of the Pumpkin, written on receiving the gift of a pumpkin pie. It's signed, A Yankee. Now, John Greenleaf Whittier never signed with pseudonyms, and certainly not in the Boston Chronotype. If he appeared in the Chronotype, it was under his name. There's only one historical instance there where uh, supposedly, according to historians, John Greenleaf Whittier signed Song of the Vermonters with the name Ethan Allen. I bet you that was Matthews, and somebody just assumed it was John Greenleaf Whittier's because Matthew would have used Ethan, see? Could be wrong. Uh, the reason the historians give is that it was too militant to accord with his Quaker religion. I bet you that. I haven't really looked into it. I bet you that was also Matthews. I mean, <laughs> there's big gaps in the history where Matthew just has been removed. It's. I know that the really tempting interpretation is that I'm imagining all these things and sticking him in, but my research says that he that there's holes all through the historical record in the 19th century concerning literary history and a few other things. And Matthew was pulled out. And sometimes those holes got filled in because, as I like to say, both nature and scholarship abhor a vacuum. <laughs> so anyway, so Matthew wrote this story, not story, Matthew wrote this poem I'm sorry, I'm rushing, and usually I edit these things out, but I don't think I'm going to today. You're going to see me uncut, you know, especially when I'm rushing around here. So Matthew wrote this poem, and thanks to Mrs. Wright, and uh, it got published duly in The Chronotype by Elijah Wright. It then appeared next in the Portland Transcript, and I happen to have that, so let me uh, pull that up here. The Portland Transcript of... December 5th, 1846. I've got to get my dollar store pillows. I'm going to try to use two of them because this is a, a monstrous volume. It's two years worth. And I want to try to go a little easy on the spine. I don't know if you can see that spine because of the lighting. Oh, you know what? I bet I look awful because I never put this light on. So we're going to put this light on. And I'll look much better. Um... I look rather ghastly without it, I'm afraid. I've got very sharp features, and if I don't use, you know, lighting to even myself out, I look like something from Halloween, to me anyway. So, uh, you know, us egotists that claim famous works, we speak like that, you know, egotistically. So here we have Song of the Pumpkin. I don't dare hold this thing up to the camera. So what I'm going to do is, uh, I've got photographs of it. And uh, it's a little bit longish, but I think I'm going to read it. That's going to be the bulk of This is going to be a short entry anyway. So, from the Boston Chronotype, this is in the Portland Transcript, Song of the Pumpkin, written on receiving the gift of a pumpkin pie by a Yankee. Oh, queenly and fair in the lands of the sun, the vine of the gourd and the rich melon run, and the rock and the tree and the cottage enfold, with broad leaves all greenness and blossoms all gold, like that which o'er Nineveh's prophet once grew, while he waited to know that his warning was true, and longed for the storm cloud, and listened in vain for the rush of the whirlwind and red fire rain. On the banks of the Zeno the dark Spanish maiden comes up with the fruit, of the tangled vine laden, and the creole of Cuba laughs out to behold, through orange leaves shining the broad spheres of gold, yet with dearer delight from his home in the north, on the fields of his harvest, the Yankee looks forth, where the crook, where the crook necks are coiling and yellow fruit shines, and the sun of September melts down on his vines. Ah, on Thanksgiving Day, when from the east and from west, when, start that again, Ah, on Thanksgiving Day, when from east and from west, from north and from south come the pilgrim and guest, when the gray-haired New Englander sees round his board the old broken links of affection restored, when the care-wearied man seeks his mother once more, and the worn matron smiles where the girl smiled before. What moistens the lip, and what brightens the eye? What calls back the past like the rich pumpkin pie? Oh, fruit loved of boyhood, the old days were calling, when wood grapes were purpling and brown nuts were falling, when wild, ugly faces we carved in its skin, glaring out through the dark with a candle within, when we laughed round the corn heap with hearts all in tune, 
our chair a broad pumpkin, our lantern the moon, telling tales of the fairy who traveled like steam in a pumpkin shell coach with two rats for her team. Then thanks for thy present, none sweeter or better ere smoked from an oven or circled a platter. Fairer hands ne'er wrought at a pastry more fine, brighter eyes never watched o'er its baking than thine. And the prayer which my mouth is too full to express swells my heart that thy shadow may never be less, that the days of thy lot may be lengthened below, and the fame of thy worth like a pumpkin vine grow, and thy life be as sweet and its last sunset sky golden tinted and fair as thy own pumpkin pie. Well, I recognize Matthew's. I, I mean, I, I have no question that's Matthew Franklin Whittier's work. I recognize his humor. I recognize his style. He signed a pseudonym that would have been typical for Matthew and atypical for John Greenleaf Whittier. It's just no question. So, I mean, we're gonna. I'm going to show you a couple similar examples in just a minute. So how did that get in poems by John G. Whittier, illustrated by H. Billings? This is published the same year by the same publisher in Boston as Chanticleer, Benjamin B. Mussey and Company, whereas the other one is B. 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 Mussey and Company, 1850. Same publisher. How in the world did this get in a book of poems by John Greenleaf Whittier? Well, one thing I notice is I don't recall that John Greenleaf Whittier ever wrote his name John G. I don't remember ever seeing that. Always, I mean, he was proud of his middle name. He was called by his middle name in his family. And always you see John Greenleaf Whittier. And I could be wrong about that, but I can't remember seeing John G. Whittier anywhere. So the question is whether John Greenleaf Whittier prepared this. I think, I think that this book was published possibly by Elijah Wright. In other words, Elijah Wright would publish books for Matthew and for John Greenleaf Whittier, both. I think he published the um, La Fontaine's Fables for Matthew and Abby. I think he published uh, Chanticleer for Matthew in Boston, whereas probably Cornelius Matthews must have published it for him in New York, the first one in 1850. And I think that Elijah Wright published this book for um, for either John Greenleaf Whittier or Matthew in Boston. Now, did Elijah Wright decide to slip it in? Did they think that it came from John Greenleaf Whittier and Matthew never disabused them of the notion since he, he only signed it a Yankee? He may not have told Elijah Wright that he wrote that. And so they must have just assumed that it had to have been John Greenleaf Whittier, you know, since he was the poet, see? And nobody really knew Matthew, as a, even his closest friends didn't know how good a poet he was. So it could have gone down that way. All I know is that that's Matthew's poem and not John Greenleaf Whittier's poem. Now, I have shared this before, but I'm going to show you a couple poems by Matthew, which are very similar in meter and style, at least to me as an untutored person, layman. So this is from the Portland Transcript, March 23, 1839, when Abby was still alive and with him. It's called Consolation. And just listen to the meter. Of course, the tone is totally different. This is him grieving for his little son, Joseph, who had died, excuse me, the previous year, less than a year earlier. Oh, what in a world like this is found when the once free heart is by sorrow bound, when the brightest joys have changed to gloom and memory lingers at the tomb, when the fondest hopes lie buried there and pleasures of youth have turned to care. You've got that meter, right? So um, I won't get the other one out again. Now, I've gone through this before, but in a book called The Rose of Sharon, which was a kind of a yearly annual series of compilation, in the very back is a poem called The Beautiful. It's signed Edwin H. Chapin. I've talked about this before. This very same poem shows up in an album that Matthew signed in 1851. And his name is on the bottom. He doesn't credit it to Chapin. It's not totally clear whether he's signing the album or signing the poem. Um, and it's just an excerpt. But listen to the um, to the meter in here. I'll, I'll read to you the portion that Matthew reproduced in the album. 
Oh, not in the outward world alone may the beautiful be to the soul made known. In its own far depths, in its inner life, silent and pure is this spirit rife. Seen in the love that is still the same, in the captive's dungeon, the martyr's flame, as it is in the hour of joy and light, when life is unclouded and hope is bright. Let's get this back. Let's get that. I've left my marker in here. Let's get the transcript back. Get my uh, dollar store pillows back where they go. And uh, let me read that to you again, just in case you've forgotten the meter of this poem. And I don't know that John Greenleaf Whittier wrote in this meter. It's not typical for him, I don't think. I mean, I'm kind of beating a dead horse here or running up the score or whatever. It's obvious. But the, the, I'm up against so much skepticism. I can feel it as well as encounter it sometimes in, you know, groups and things online. So I feel like I have to kind of indulge in a little overkill. So here we go with this one. Oh, queenly and fair in the lands of the sun, the vine of the gourd and the rich melon run, and the rock and the tree and the cottage enfold with broad leaves, all greenness and blossoms, all gold, like that which o'er Nineveh's prophet once grew while he waited to know that his warning was true. See the same meter, basically? So this is an instance where Matthew Franklin Whittier's work was mistakenly and continues to be mistakenly attributed to his brother, John Greenleaf Whittier. I'm sure that John Greenleaf wouldn't have done that on purpose. He never, you know, disavowed it that I know of, but everybody just assumes and his name goes on there. Matthew's work is all over the place with other people's names on it. This is what I've been trying to get across. It is not that I'm crazy and just grabbing things and trying to claim them. That has nothing to do with it. It's, it's not the dynamic that's going on here. The dynamic is that Matthew's work, which I have come to recognize and to track down, is all over the place with all kinds of people's names. Edwin Chapin's name, John Greenleaf Whittier's name, Cornelius Matthews' name. <laughs> you know, it's all over. And some of them are famous and some of them aren't. And to me... It really doesn't make that much difference. I want to bring all of Matthew's literary children home, the famous ones and the not so famous ones, because this poem in the Rose of Sharon attributed to Edward H. Chapin is better than the Raven. This is a magnificent poem, this one. The, the one about the pumpkin is pretty darn good, and he just did it just as a thank you, you know, as a, as a, as a thank you to Mrs. Wright, you know, but this is a poem. <laughs> it's world class. It's it's way better than the raven, except that it's a statement of faith. See, so faith poetry doesn't isn't famous now because officially the world has disproven God and disproven the soul, and there's no faith anymore. See, we're all running around without any faith in anything, basically. Um, but this is this is better. <laughs> he wrote quite a few things that were at least as good, if not better, than the raven. You know, and that's one of them. So uh, I thought that might be interesting since this doesn't relate directly to The Raven and it doesn't relate directly to A Christmas Carol. I expect we'll get five views of this instead of 15 like we have on the others, you know. But the reason I focus on the famous ones is to try to stir up a little trouble primarily. You know, I'm trying to create a buzz. And uh, so far I've been studiously ignored. Occasionally one or two people might read my paper online. Or actually I think it was five in the last few days. So like, you know, maybe one per day or a few per day. Um, nobody writes me, nobody is interested, but they just silently come and look at it. And I'll tell you, I mean, I haven't put out the one on Poe yet. That's for maybe three months from now, two, three months from now. The one on uh, Dickens has got some really solid evidence and smoking guns in it. Nobody who is in their right mind who is not lying to themselves or to somebody else can look at that paper and say that it's bullshit or that it's drivel, as one person put it. They can't, nobody can honestly say that because I've come up with some points, some evidence that as far as I know, nobody's ever thought of, you know? Just one of those is enough to put me on the map if they're honest, if the scholars are honest. Just one of them. Just one of those discoveries that I made in there is enough for any buddy's PhD thesis, you know, and more. You know, any one of those discoveries would put anybody on the map. And I was, I was looking for more people to write to regarding Edgar Allan Poe. 
And um, when I put in the search terms, uh, the Raven analysis, you know, there's like 25 or 30 different companies that will help you with their homework. And they've all got essays on the Raven that you could buy. <laughs> Same thing goes with a Christmas carol. It, I mean, it's so deeply embedded in the culture that these things belong to Charles Dickens and Edgar Allan Poe, respectively. And they're, they're flat wrong. As they said in the Lord of the Rings, you know, they, they were all of them deceived, every single one. So what do you do with a discovery that's that radical? You know, I mean, what do I do with it? Because I think that people just assume that if it was real, if I had really found something, I would be like all over the news. You know, I would be on the PBS Evening do News being interviewed by Jeffrey Brown and I would be, you know, all over. Rolling Stone and, you know, Oprah would be talking to me and, and they may at some point, but I mean, it's too much from somebody who's too small. You know what I'm saying? Therefore, it's automatically dismissed because who is he? See, that's the, I think that's the uh, biggest objection is who is, who is he? Who does he think he is? You know, who is this guy? And that disproves it because nobody that's a nobody could ever come up with a discovery that big, see, but I did. <laughs> I'm going to get this thing edited very roughly. You're going to see an awful lot of uh, me stumbling around in this one because I don't want to spend, you know, two hours editing this. Just get the images in and let it run. And uh, if something else comes up. Well, I've got, I think by Monday, which is, I think, what, three days from now, um, my own antiquarian copy, first edition of Chanticleer, a Thanksgiving story of the Peabody family will be coming in the mail. It does not have Cornelius Matthews' name on it because I looked that up. So he didn't sign the first one. There's also also a second edition that came out in the same year, maybe because it's sold so well. I don't know. Uh, that one's online, so I can compare them. His name didn't get associated with this book until 1856, six years later. See, So uh, I think what happened is that Matthew said, don't tell anybody. And uh, Matthews published it for him anonymously. And people kept assuming his family, everybody assumed it was his book and they praised him and how wonderful and it was selling like hotcakes. And finally, he, uh, he did the morally convenient thing and admitted, just like Margaret Fuller did with the star, admitted that he had been the author and put his name on one that he published in 1856 and subsequent editions. And it must have made him quite a bit of money. Um, that's the only way I can see it going down. Matthew probably asked Cornelius Matthews, his former editor, he forgave him for having stiffed him before. And he said, I tell you what, if you'll publish this for me, we'll be even. That's what Matthew must have done. And so Cornelius Matthews published it for him. Matthew, of course, took the profits, you know, but he may have given him something for publishing it for him. And, uh, and then everybody just assumed that it was written by Cornelius Matthews and, and he couldn't resist taking credit for it. Uh, so there you have it. And uh, I tell you what, if, if uh, YouTube wouldn't flag it, I would put on a, a little uh, relevant excerpt from Matlock, which I've used in my written blog. But if I did that, they would flag it and suddenly I'd have a problem. So I don't dare do it. Um, anyway, I hope you found this interesting, and uh, probably when I get that antiquarian copy in, I'll go ahead and show it to you.